okay and uh, youtube channel is also i am starting youtube channel also yes sir live streaming yeah one minute yeah. so that yes it is there no problem and uh, you can start sure so good evening to one and all i welcome everyone today i would like to tell all of you that we got a very eminent speaker in between us and it's a pleasure sir to have you here now i would like to invite dr silpa jani state president gujarat and she will introduce the speaker yes good evening everybody uh, all respected dignitaries and dear participants good evening and warm welcome to all on behalf of microbiologist society of india it is my privilege to introduce today's resource person dr ashok ratnam welcome you sir professor ashok ratan is a medical microbiologist md mams commonwealth fellow insa dfg fellow who temporary advisor and who lab director we feel blessed to have you with us sir sir is having many important positions in academics in reputed medical colleges like aims new delhi jawaharlal nehru medical college aligarh etc he is also associated with industrial research diagnostics and public health he has published more than 100 research papers and guided over 40 students of md ms or phd he is also associated with 30 international patents and he contributed in different books by writing many chapters the most interesting is along with his bright career he is sports person he captained cricket and tennis teams during his university studies thank you sir for sparing your time thank you very much sir should i start yes sir please sure yes sir. yes sir you can proceed <laughs> Yes, sir. You can. Yes, it is visible. Just getting okay. One minute. Yeah. Right, sir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Deshmukh. It was a pleasure coming in contact with you. Mm, and uh, with jay and thank you ma'am for your kind words uh, i would talk about the role of neutralizing antibodies in recovery from covid-19 infection and protection after vaccination it was on 30 uh, 31st december 2019 that who was informed that they were a few <coughs> of pneumonia caused by a novel coronavirus in wuhan within 10 days one full sequence of this rna virus was made available in the public domain next day five more sequences were made available so within 10 days we knew that we were dealing with a novel coronavirus which had similarity which had similarities 
could everybody else please mute yourself? I would like to request everybody. Can you please keep yourself muted? You can mute. You can mute. Jay, you mute. Yes. Okay. So Thank the virus was called a novel coronavirus, but within 10 days, because the full genome sequence was available and multiple copies were available from China, it was clear that though there were similarities with the SARS, uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, which had appeared in 2003, again from China, then to Hong Kong, Singapore, and Canada, but it had some differences. So it was labeled as SARS-CoV-2. This is an RNA virus. It's a single standard RNA virus, which had about 30,000 bases. And it had four prominent proteins, the spike protein, which gives it the name of Corona because it looks like a crown then the envelope protein, and it had membrane so that it's sensitive to ether inactivation. Inside was a nuclear capsid protein. And as I said, genetically, it was similar, but still different. So it was called SARS-CoV-2. As soon as the sequence was available, CDC Atlanta started making PCR and they focused on the NG, as you see on the right side of the genome. They focused on the N gene and they found that N1, N2, and N3 were three regions which were particular to the coronavirus, to this SARS-CoV-2. But their kit got contaminated and so their results could not be reproduced when given to other labs. In the meantime, Berlin Institute in um, Koch Institute in Berlin focused on the E gene, the envelope gene, and they found that the E gene was common. But after E gene was positive, then you could detect RD RP, which is RNA dependent RNA polymerase, and that would be specific for, for SARS-CoV-2. So their kit based on first detection of E gene followed by RDRP was adapted by WHO and then made available to various national public health laboratories. So the consequence of the development that has occurred, that the next generation sequencing made the whole genome of novel coronavirus available within 10 days of the world coming to know that there was an outbreak of a novel virus was in diagnostics so that there was identification of the species, RT-PCR based on N-gene by CDC USA, RT-PCR based on E-gene and RDRP gene or by Cox Institute. Subsequently, RT-LAMP and CRISPR were also developed. And along with that, though the virus was not available with any one of them in the West, looking at the, vac uh, looking at the genome, the messenger RNA vaccine designs could be made. DNA vaccine using viral vector could be designed. Both are novel approaches and they have been tried with repeated failures in HIV and HCV. Both are RNA viruses, human immunodeficiency virus and, human, uh, and hepatitis C virus. Both are RNA viruses and these approaches were used with failure. But because people started working immediately that the genes were known, it was possible to make vaccines at pandemic speed during this pandemic. 
So SARS-CoV-2 is the third coronavirus which has caused severe infection in human beings. Overall, there are seven coronaviruses which infect human beings. The first one among the severe infections was SARS-CoV-1, which appeared in 2003. It binds to ACE2 receptors. It is spread through the respiratory secretions. It had a mortality of 10%. About 800 persons died. And then before a vaccine could be, could be developed, the virus disappeared. And after 2003, it has not been detected anywhere else, 2003-2004. Then subsequently in 2012, from Jordan and Saudi Arabia, through the camels, bats and then camels, emerged what is known as MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, re Respiratory Syndrome Virus, which had low mortality as long as it, will, it was in the Middle East. But Middle East persons have a tendency to travel overseas for medical treatment. And during this time, they preferred to go to the universities of South Korea. In South Korea, it led to severe outbreak and mortality was about 34% of those infected. Then we have SARS-CoV-2, which appeared in 2019. And, and now we know that it is not only respiratory droplets which spread and fomites, but it is also airborne. The other viruses which had appeared earlier were 229E, which was in 1962, and organ culture 43, a virus which grew on organ culture. These were both causing common cold. I would again request everybody to please mute themselves. So 229E and OC43 were the viruses which were already known, coronaviruses, and they were associated with common cold. Subsequently, two more viruses were identified, but they also have been associated with common cold. So there are four viruses which are associated with common cold and three viruses which are associated with severe respiratory, acute respiratory tract infection. Now we know that though only seven coronaviruses affect human beings, there are about 45 species and they have been divided into four groups, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and mammals are affected by alpha and beta coronaviruses, while birds are affected by delta, and whales and birds are affected by gamma. So, though and now the virus has become attuned for human-to-human -human transmission, originally all coronaviruses were from animal origin and are examples of zoonotic disease. Among the three, as I said that 2003, you had SARS-CoV-1, then MERS in 2012, and now we have SARS-CoV-2. COVID and by the 26th August, 2021, it has caused more than 213 million infections and 4 million deaths worldwide. Initially, when the virus 
the disease was described, it was said that it causes fever, cough, and shortness of breath, that it is asymptomatic in a large number, and in adults and elderly, it was more dangerous. Subsequently, CDC Atlanta had indicated that anybody coming with cough, which is normally non-productive cough, and shortness of breath, or at least any two of the following, which means fever, chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, or diarrhea, or new loss of taste or smell. Sometimes they noticed that loss of taste or smell was, much, was one of the earliest symptoms to appear. This, these should be tested for the presence of SARS-CoV-2. So that not to stigmatize either the place or the animal or any locality, WHO suggested that we should call the disease as COVID-19 and the virus as SARS-CoV-2. So that unlike in the past, when they would say it is Spanish flu or Delhi belly or etc., this time the suggestion was, and that has been normally used, that the virus will be called SARS-CoV-2 and the disease that it causes will be caused COVID-19. The large S glycoproteins are used by the virus to gain entry to human cells. They most likely attach to angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptors on the cell membrane allowing the virus entry. The exact mechanism for this is not known. Most likely, as shown here, the human cell ingests the virus in a process known as endocytosis. Once inside the cytoplasm, the endosome opens to reveal the virus's genetic material, a single-stranded RNA. The virus hijacks the cell's machinery to replicate the RNA in N proteins and uses the endoplasmic reticulum to form its N protein outer layer and the all important S protein. After replication, the virus is carried by the Golgi bodies out of the cell in a process known as exocytosis. So after once there is exocytosis, the cell will die. Subsequently, we have come to learn that the virus, the infection is present. It's a viral infection which is transmitted through the respiratory route. The virus is present in the first phase. You can divide the infection or the disease into three phases. In the early phase, it's the virus which is present. Then the virus will move on to the lungs and involve the pulmonary phase. During this time, if the host response, neutralizing antibodies are set up, then a person will, will recover. If instead of neutralizing antibodies, there's a delay in neutralizing antibodies, then the virus will trigger host inflammatory immune response. And this is where the cytokine storm will be kicked off and that might act fatally. So we could divide the infection or the disease into early stage where the virus is in large quantity the pulmonary stage where there is oxygen desaturation, which is then followed either by recovery or proceeding on to cytokine strong and death. During the early stage, virus is present. During the late stage, there is no virus. So the disease is caused by the virus but death is not caused by the virus. Death is because of altered human immune response. So the virus is the trigger. The virus is 
is what pulls the trigger, but death results as a consequence of our immune response. Now, uh, as I indicated, the virus binds, binds to the ACE2 receptors. ACE2 receptors are present on the surface of our upper respiratory tract cells as well as lower respiratory tract cells. Wherever ACE2 receptors are present, which is in the blood vessels, in the brain, in the renal, that means in the kidney, in the liver, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the heart, in the endocrines, and in dermatology, you would find that the virus will cause infection. And as a consequence of the infection and inflammation that result, you would have the clinical features depending on where the virus has been able to travel during the first few days of infection. If you have to identify it, then in the early stage, in the early stage of infection, the RNA is present in the respiratory secretion. Subsequently, after a lag of about seven to 10 days, the antibodies kick in. Normally, it is the IgM antibodies which appear first, and then they switch to IgG. In this case, that's not the, not the situation. Here, either IgG and IgM occur together or very close to each other, and IgM doesn't switch to IgG. There is also IgA, which the German scientists pay a lot of attention, but they have not found favor with any other group of scientists. Reports from Wuhan had indicated that if you rely only on RT-PCR for your diagnosis, then at the best of times with clinical features, you would have only RT-PCR positive in maximum 80% of cases. And thereafter, they'll be declined. Lee from Wuhan had indicated that if you add antibodies to the detection, then after nine days, antibodies can play a good role for helping you make a diagnosis. Miller, so if you're talking about gold standard, and many persons use this term very loosely, RT-PCR, by no stretch of imagination, can be a good gold standard for making a diagnosis. Today, we are not going to dwell more on into diagnosis, except give you one more example from Harvard University, where Miller, where Miller tested and reported on everybody who was admitted with clinical features of COVID to their hospital in Boston. And he reported that in the first nine days, RT-PCR was the test which gave the best results. And antibodies were either not detectable or very low. But after nine days, the percentage of patients coming positive with serology were more than those who were coming positive with RT-PCR. And by the third week, most of the persons admitted were positive for, uh, for antibody test. They suggested that when used as a complementary test with RT-PCR, antibodies after so after first nine days, serology can function as a reliable diagnostic aid 
for indicating recent or prior infection. Today, our focus is on not on the virus, but on the immune response, on host response that it elicits. As you would notice, that after exposure to the antigen, either as a consequence of infection or after vaccination, there is a lag phase for antibodies to appear. Lag phase of about nine days or so. After nine days, the titer of antibodies keep rising. After reaching a peak, as with any other infection, there is a fall in titer. The, this fall, which is a normal phenomena, have been labeled as some quick doctors as vanishing antibodies. Antibody, the anti-COVID antibodies do not vanish, but they decrease as is the norm. It is only when you give a second exposure would high titers of antibodies would be made and sustained. That is the principle of any vaccination, that the initial infection or vaccination will prime the immune response. And it is the subsequent inoculation or infection which will stimulate the memory T cells so that you will get a good and quick second immune, secondary immune response which will lead to production and sustaining of high titers. The virus has two antigens which are of our interest. One is nuclear capsid protein, and Dr. Prakash has already mentioned about nuclear capsid protein, and there is spike protein, which is the nuclear capsid protein is the most immunogenic, and this resides inside the virus. The nuclear capsid protein resides inside the virus, while the spike protein is the virus, uh, is the protein which is jutting. I request everybody, please keep yourself muted. Spike protein is the protein which is jutting out from the membrane, and this is what attaches to ACE2 receptor. So, nuclear capsid protein is the most immunogenic and the most abundant. Spike protein, it appears that every viral virus or vi virion has about 74 spikes. So the spike protein will be on the surface. And uh, when you want to look at the response, you would find that RNA is the one to detect in the first 10 days or so. But subsequently, antibodies are what should be used for diagnosis. And, and CDC says that it is, it's of no consequence whether you detect IgG, IgM or IgA for making a diagnosis. <coughs> However, our function is to study the neutralizing antibodies. As you see on the left, the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is expressed on the surface of human cells through its spike protein and what when it binds to the ACE2 receptor, it is internalized and infection starts. Our hope is that neutralizing antibodies which are produced would bind to the spike protein and will saturate all the spike proteins so that the spike protein cannot bind to ACE2 receptors This antibodies cannot bind, and this virus now, which is coated by neutralizing antibodies, will not be able to bind to ACE2 receptor and initiate infection.
Zhao from China had also indicated that not everybody responds to the infection by producing high quantity of antibodies. It is only those who have critical infection and severe infection requiring admission to ICU that they produce high titer of antibodies. While those who have mild infection or are asymptomatic are less likely to have high titers of antibodies. This might explain why many convalescent plasma trials gave different results and some even failed because our quick clinicians were not testing for the presence of neutralizing antibodies before giving plasma. And you would agree with me that it is the persons who have recovered from severe COVID infection are very <laughs> unlikely to donate their plasma. <laughs> While those who have had mild infection are more likely to donate their plasma, but that plasma would not contain sufficient neutralizing antibodies and so would not be useful. So to test for the presence of anti-spike or neutralizing antibodies and to look for a titer of more than 1,000 would make sure. And when they did this in Brazil, they found that uh, when administered within 72 hours to persons who have comorbidity and are at risk would protect them from either being admitted or moving on to severe infection. So that high titer plasma therapy would be useful provided it contains high titers and is given within 72 hours that antibodies protect animals was demonstrated very well. Initially, they caused infection in Beijing in monkeys. And once the monkeys recovered, when you challenge them again, you cannot reinfect them. So in 2020, it was clear that reinfection was not very common. When the plasma was transfused into Syrian hamsters, which is the animal model for, uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, they were protected because antibodies will prevent the entry of SARS-CoV-2 to, to uh, binding to ACE2 receptors and entry into the cell. Scientists in USA also looked at the B lymphocytes of recovered persons and they could isolate the gene which produces the antibodies of IgG type and could make monoclonal antibody, human monoclonal antibodies, which will have high neutralizing activity. And the proof of the pudding was when it was used in the then President Donald Trump, when he came down positive with, uh, with RT-PCR and was administered a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies. Cocktail is used so that the, by that time we had come to know that the virus is mutating. And to prevent, if you use only monoclonal, one monoclonal antibody, which will bind to the spike protein. And if there's any mutation, then there'll be resistance. So right from the beginning, they have used cocktail of monoclonal antibodies so that it will bind to at least two sites. And unless both sites are mutated, the antibodies will work. And they did work. And President Donald Trump was back into campaign within a few days of testing RT-PCR positive. What is the titer which correlates with immunity or protection was worked out in non-human primates. Here, once they had purified 
IgG antibodies, which they have shown to contain neutralizing antibodies, they injected different concentration of purified antibodies into groups of monkeys. One group got 250 milligrams per kg body weight. The second group got 25 milligrams per kg body weight. Third group got 2.5 milligrams per kg body weight. And the fourth group was the control, which did not get anything. Subsequently, after three days, they were challenged with live coronavirus. When they were challenged, only the animals which had received 250 milligrams per kg body weight of purified antibodies did not have infection. Every other animal had infection. So when they did the antibody titer of the animals who were protected, they found that the antibody titer in these monkeys, anti-spike was more than 40, 400, anti-RBD was more than 100, neutralizing antibodies was more than 50%. So this could serve as a benchmark for protection. Since evidence was accumulating that the virus is spreading in a pandemic fashion, and unlike SARS-CoV-1, this is not going to disappear, and that antibodies to spike protein offer protection, most of the persons who were making vaccines focused on spike protein either using messenger RNA or converting the spike protein into the DNA, uh, taking the DNA of the spike protein and inserting it into a vector or taking spike proteins itself. So all the vax, except for, uh, except for covaxin, which has used the old methodology of whole virus, which is inactivated, and Sinopharm. Everybody else have focused on spike protein in one way or the other. Spike protein is a trimer. And as I said, it is on the surface. There are about 74 spike proteins. It is normally present in a closed formation. The tetramers are in a closed formulation. The spike protein consi is, consists of 1,273 amino acids and can be divided into S1 and S2. S1 has a place, has a region known as receptor binding domain. The receptor binding domain has another region within it, which is known as receptor binding motif. And the ACE2 receptor binds to the receptor binding motif or the other way around. Receptor binding motif, which is contained within the receptor binding domain, which is contained within the S1 region, binds to the ACE2 receptors. In S2 subunit, there's a fusion peptide this fusion peptide, once the receptor binding domain has bound to ACE2 receptor, then the fusion peptide will get active and would then fuse the cell membrane of the virus with the human cell. And then the RNA of the virus will enter into the cytoplasm of the human cell and take over the protein synthesis machinery of the human cell. In 2020, the original strain, strain had motifs which were closed. One mutation outside the receptor binding domain. This mutation is known as D 
614G, where aspartic acid converted into glycine. And as you see here, that one of the three pentamers were opened. When it became opened, it had better affinity for ACE2 receptor. And so it could be transmitted better from one person to another person. This did not affect the virulence. It did not affect the severity of infection or immune escape, but it infected, it affected the transmissibility. And subsequently, the mutations which have occurred in the receptor binding domain of the receptor bind, a receptor binding motif of the receptor binding domain have led to immune escape. And in the Delta variant, there's a mutation very near the fusion protein so that now the P681R proline to arginine very near the fusion protein has led to better union of the virus with, uh, with, with the human cell. As a consequence, immune inf the infection is more severe. The virus multiplies more. And if along with that, there is E484Q or T478K, that means glutamic acid to glutamic, glutamine or threonine to lysine. If this mutation is there, then there will be immune escape too. So in 2020, the mutation which occurred was D614G. In 2021, the mutation which has occurred is the Delta variation, which has accumulation of not one mutation, but multiple mutation. But the critical one is better fusion. And now you notice that we have overcome the second wave which devastated nearly whole of India. But the virus, the Delta variant is spreading all over the world and is now the dominant virus in Indonesia and USA. All 50 states of USA are reeling under Delta virus infection. In this bleak scenario, there is the production of monoclonal antibodies. And these monoclonal antibodies will neutralize when used in combination, they will neutralize any of the variants and can be useful if the body is not, produce, not able to produce neutralizing antibodies, then these monoclonal antibodies provided they are administered to the recipient within 72 hours of exposure would be protective. It's also been seen that not only would they be used intravenously, it can also be given subcutaneously and can be used both for prophylaxis as well as for therapeutic purpose. These are commercially available even in India through CIPLA. So now coming to the serological tests. Before we comment on the serological tests, we should look at whether the antigen use is nuclear capsid protein, the spike protein, or the receptor binding domain. Then whether the antibodies which you are commenting upon is total antibodies, IgG antibodies, or IgM and IgG antibodies. And what is the type of assay? Is it the binding assay or is this the neutralizing assay? I will explain the difference between binding assay and neutralizing assay more. But nuclear capsid protein since the nuclear capsid protein is within the virus, it has no role to play in protection. 
So as Dr. Prakash said, he was doing zero survey. Nuclear captured protein is excellent as an antigen if your purpose is to do zero survey. Because if you, if you detect total antibodies to nuclear capsid protein, then since nuclear capsid protein part which is used is specific to SARS-CoV-2, this would mean that the person has been exposed to this novel coronavirus. But it gives no indication about protection. It only mentions about infection. For protection, you have to have antibodies to the spike protein, which are outside the virus. And if you have antibodies to the receptor binding domain, then that will be more relevant. Now, these could be binding or could be neutralizing. And as I said, I will explain the difference between the two. Then you should depend on what is the format you're going to use. If you want the results now, then you might want to use lateral flow rapid test. The advantage of this lateral flow rapid test is that it takes a drop of peripheral blood, whole blood will do, and it will give you results in 15 minutes time or so. The disadvantage is that it is not very sensitive. However, scientists have tried to change the label from colloidal gold to immunofluorescence. And then by using a more sensitive method of detection and a fluorimeter, they can then do a quantitative test and tell you what is the titer of antibodies in 15 minutes time. So it could be useful for field purposes. On the other hand, there is ELISA, which NIV Pune had made and many companies have made. ELISA based on, again, ELISA's value will depend on whether you're using nuclear capsid protein or spike protein or RBD portion of the vaccine. But the problem with ELISA is reproducibility because it is manual. So your attempt, if you want to get reproducible result, is to convert ELISA from manual into automated as far as possible. Of course, the best would be to use chemiluminescence, chemiluminescence and an automated system where the only intervention is that you place the sample and the machine will do everything. That will be the most sensitive and the most reproducible. All right, so what I'm trying to say is that not all antibodies test are the same. They are not equal. If your purpose is for epidemiology, then choosing nuclear capsid protein is ideal because nuclear capsid protein is the most abundant, the most immunogenic, but it stays within the cell, within the virus, so it has no role in protection. On the other hand, if you bind to S2, to the spike, if you bind to S2 or S1 and not to RBD, then your binding antibodies are present, but it is a surrogate for protection. It is not really giving you protection. It is like if a person walks into your room with a knife in his hand, if you can neutralize his, if you can hold his hand, which has the knife, then you have neutralized him. On the other hand, if you hold his leg or his neck, then you have bound him, but he can still harm you. So you have not neutralized him. That would mean that all neutralizing antibodies are binding antibodies, but not 
all binding antibodies are neutralizing antibodies. When you talk about neutralization, the gold standard for neutralization is a test known as PRINT, Plaque Reduction Neutralization Test. This PRINT is used on a cell culture and virus cells are what is used and the sample containing the virus is layered over that. And if the virus is present, then it will enter into the cell, it will dig up, it will cause cytopathogenic effect. So when you, when, when you stain it after three to five days, you will find that there are holes in the monolayers. If now the sample can be first incubated with patient's plasma, and then poured, and you find that there are no, no wells or the number of or the plaques have decreased, then this will be positive for neutralization. So this is the print test. The only problem is that you need BSL-3 laboratories besides technical skills and the facilities to do this. And so it is suitable only for national reference and research laboratories, and is not suitable for diagnostic laboratories. Plus it takes three to five days. So since the virus is highly pathogenic, BSL-3 facilities are required. And so in India, only NIV Pune and maybe NCDC Delhi are the two labs which are authorized to culture the virus or to detect the virus. And once that is there, then, then they can do print test. But the routine laboratories cannot. So the scientists then use the antigen and the, the gene of the spike protein and inserted that into a harmless virus. So this becomes a pseudo virus. And now, since the virus will express the spike protein, and we are interested only in the spike protein, and it's binding to the ACE2 receptors, you can use this pseudovirus and get the same investigation done. The tests have been devised in China. It has been published in Nature Protocols and also in, uh, in Italy. But the advantage is that routine labs can use this. A routine lab is normally BSL-2, but it'll still take three to five days. So if you want the results on the same day, then you have to do further investigation. And scientists have genetically engineered receptor binding domain and ACE2 receptors so that now they have devised a cell-free and virus-free test, which is the ELISA format, where ACE2 receptors are plated onto ELISA plates to act as the binding agent. Then the receptor binding domain already is linked with HRP as the, uh, as the enzyme. And if the RBD is neutralized, then uh, it will not be available to bind to ACE2 receptors and would be washed away from the plate. If, on the other hand, the plasma does not contain antibodies, then RBD will be able to bind and color re development will occur. So this way, you can find neutralizing test and report on it. This was used in China and in Singapore with COVID patients and healthy controls, and they gave very good results. This test was then commercially available, approved by US FDA, also by ICMR and DCGI. And as luck would have it, initially the cost was very high because it had to be imported, but subsequently an Indian firm has also made this and the results of the Indian firm with that of the imported test are nearly synonym. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19. These antibodies, termed as neutralizing antibodies, stop SARS-CoV-2 from infecting the cell. 
not all antibodies that are against SARS-CoV-2 can stop an infection. Other antibody or serology tests typically detect antibodies that are able to bind SARS-CoV-2 proteins. These kits, however, only tell us that antibodies are present, but they do not tell us if they can stop the Okay, uh, so in 2020, low resolution, so I guess, do we have some more time? I think uh, a few, few more minutes, I think you okay. Sir, you can take your time. Let me see if I can go back. So, I guess the rest I can tell you uh, uh, visually now. Uh, so we had done the study in 2020 and then again in 2021. And we found that in 2020, the titers were very low, both for nucle nuclear capsid protein as well as spike protein. But when we tested on neutralizing antibodies, then we find that after vaccination, uh, the titers are mixed. There are some as low titers, some as high titers, while after, after a person has had one dose of vaccination and all, already suffered from infection, then very high titers are found. But it has also been seen that not everybody produces high titers of antibodies, especially persons with immunodeficiency or elderly. So even after two doses of vaccination, the titers may not be high in persons who are old. And this is what we also notice. So um, that persons who, who, have, uh, who are old and have comorbidities should get their titers checked. Then the final part was why some people die and others survive. It was noticed in a Yale study that persons who produced and neutralizing antibodies by 14th day would survive. But if they do not have neutralizing antibodies by 14th day and have had infection, then that infection might end fatally, indicating that 14th day is critical to decide whether cytokine storm will be kicked in or you would recover. So when should neutralizing antibodies? So one is, I think I've provided you sufficient evidence to say that neutralizing antibodies are protective. Second is that not everybody produces neutralizing antibodies. The titers that have worked in animals are that you should have anti-spike antibodies of at least 400, anti-RBD antibodies of at least 100, and anti-neutralizing antibodies of 50%. Uh, when should you 
test for neutralizing antibodies. One is after you have taken vaccination and if you feel that you may not have produced enough antibodies, then 14 days after the second dose, you should get your neutralizing antibodies done. If you have more than 30% neutralization, then you are protected. Then you are exposed and you are protected. Exposed, that means exposed to the, to the antigens and you have reacted to the antigen and you are protected. So now when you get exposed again, you would produce high titer antibodies. Second one is if you have, uh, if you are suffering from infection, then on 14th day, if you have produced antibodies, then that means you have recovered. It also means that if by 14th day you are infected and you don't have antibodies on the 14th day, then everybody should worry. And if you want to use monoclonal antibodies, as soon as RT-PCR is positive, you should test for antibodies. If antibodies are not present, then monoclonal antibodies, which cost about 50 to 60,000, would be life-saving. But if antibodies are present, then you need not take the monoclonal antibodies. So uh, I must, at the end, I must tell you that no authority is indicating that you should test for neutralizing antibodies. But every scientist, every scientific comment in the literature is based on the presence or absence of neutralizing antibodies. CMI may also play a role. CMI may also play a role, but at this moment, we do not have a handle on how much CMI is required. It also appears that mutations lead to uh, escape from neutralizing antibodies, but T lymphocytes are still active whether there is mutation in the spike protein or not. So I think uh, I've covered up what I wanted to cover. If there are any questions, we could then address that if there's time. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ratan. It was really very interesting and informative lecture. Uh, doctor, I wanted to ask you about the uh, you know, you said about these neutralizing antibodies, you know, that they might be absent and that is uh, uh, really worrisome, right? Um, so, uh, uh, did the medication in, in some people, maybe those neutralizing antibodies were not there up to a certain level, which was supposed to be there and therefore it proved fatal. So, did the medication come in the way of uh, the production of these neutralizing antibodies in the COVID patients? No, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, it is because of, uh, of old age as, or of immunosuppression. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a paper out today where they have given the third dose to persons who have tr transplants. And as you know, when they have transplants, then they also have immunosuppression. So those will, those will be conditions where the medicines, the immunosuppressants, are preventing them from making antibodies. But when you give a third dose, then 55% responded. So not 100% respond. But if a person has antibodies, then uh, see, there are three things required. One is infection. The second one is admission to hospital. And third is death. It's, it appears if you compare vaccination versus non-vaccinated, non-vaccinated are eight times more at risk of picking up infection and 25 times more of being admitted to the hospital than persons who are vaccinated and 24 times more uh, chances of death in those who are not vaccinated than those who are vaccinated. So vaccines are not preventing infection. It is preventing admission to hospital and death. And, but 
in case it is working if vaccine is not working then it can then you can take two doses and still a person will die and it is vaccines will work by producing and utilizing antibodies thank you sir hello sir may i yes 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 you can sir it was really wonderful quite effective please introduce uh, yourself please introduce uh, so this is dr mehul dave i am uh, one of the co coordinator in gujarat and uh, i am handling gandhinagar and ahmedabad and i am working as an associate professor and head in life science department of iite uh, should i ask questions sir sir Please. why uh, you know in your talk you mentioned that uh, the passive administration of uh, this neutralizing antibody is uh, along with it is having therapeutic application it is prophylactic also yes so it is it is prophylactic in the mean in the uh, meaning that it is it gives protection for few days like you know what we understand passive immunity stays for around 8 to 10 days or it gives longer protection I think how how it is prophylactic sir uh, prophylactic means that you have been exposed i see uh, for example uh, if you have not been vaccinated and you are uh, what happened is when uh, when delta variant came it is highly infectious so if one person gets infection in the house everybody gets infection in the house so suppose uh, you have elderly parents in the house you can then you know that one person has come down with rt pcr positive but you want to do home quarantine in that case the elderly persons can be given uh, given this subcutaneously which is what has happened and uh, that they'll be protected for the uh, for the duration of the illness and you know the infection the infectious state is for 7 to 10 days beyond 7 to 10 days there is uh, there's no infectiousness rt pcr may be positive but the virus is replicative virus is present only for 7 to 8 days i have one question sir if i may be permitted to ask Sure, ma'am. Um, uh, first of all, I would like. Yes, ma'am. You can ask. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I had already introduced myself. All the same, I am introducing again. I am Dr. Rumpa, Dr. Rumpa Saha, Professor of Microbiology from UCMS and GTB Hospital, uh, Delhi. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Ashok Prasad Sir, as his talks are, as usual, always very lucid, explanatory, and wonderfully taken for everybody to understand thank you so much sir we always enjoy his talks and you know if i don't get, get i to you know get a hold of him and to give me the link if i'm not able to get it also myself uh, what i wanted to ask you sir is that you said um, when we see that uh, there is 30% neutralizing antibody anti spike protein so we know that the person may be protected um, how do we ensure this 30% um, uh, Uh, as a thirty percent antibody is there? How do we ensure this, sir? Oh, uh, see, uh, what what happens is that uh, the that they have uh, they have a dose for the RBD. The RBD is then mixed with the patient's uh, plasma, incubated for half an hour, and then you do a LISA. So if uh, if thirty percent of RBD which is there has been neutralized. then the results of actually i had the results because we we have done this test both for anti spike which is binding and neutralizing results will come as percentage of inhibition most of the persons who have recovered from infection and have had one dose their neutralizing uh, neutralization is 95 to 97% right and some of us who have not responded we have 5% of neutralization so it's a very very strong discriminatory right thank you sir thank you and these uh, these are available commercially by j mitra and it's uh, fairly cheap and eliza anybody can do right j mitra uh, advocates this this i know right thank you sir thank you sir thank you anyone again want to ask question please hello sir 
I'm Lakshmi Devi from Mysore University. I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Sir, in case of RT-PCR, it has showed negative result for a person. And in case of CT scan, it has showed positive for uh, SARS-CoV-19. And the person has felt breathlessness, fever, and a dry cough. So what will be the um, cause for this? Uh, I mean, the result is showing heart PCR negative in that case, specific case, sir. Ma'am, uh, as I said, uh, that RT-PCR is not uh, diagnostic in 100% of cases who are uh, who clinically are suspected to be COVID infection. Uh, at best, it is 80%, and that is on the seventh or eighth day of infection. Thereafter, it decreases. So, uh, it is the patient, as um, as every, every uh, lab person will say, that you should treat the patient and not the uh, not the report the report is only to support you in making your diagnosis if a person is symptomatic then you should treat the patient as suffering from covid infection rt pcr positive or negative and in from wuhan itself there were reports that they followed up that time they used to do uh, RT-PCR test every second day and they'll find that one day it is positive, the next day it is negative then we had been advocating and there was a paper from Yale which indicated that instead of taking respiratory secretions you should take saliva that respiratory secretion depends upon where whether you, because the infection is patchy, you might touch the right area or you may not touch the right area but since it also affects the salivary glands, the titers in the viral titers in saliva were consistent and persistent. So saliva was the better uh, sample. But of course, uh, you know we've had uh, we've had a lot of debate on whether CT values should be shared or not. Well, so we've had persons, and in, in India the trouble is they don't produce evidence and then say, make policies. They make policies and they say, follow it. <laughs> that is one of the problems. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Prakash Halami want to ask the question, please. Yes, sir, <coughs> sir uh, good evening. Good evening. Actually, we see large number of breakthrough infections. And what we have seen in our zero surveillance that the people with the infection, they have basically large amount of the antibodies developed. So do you think that uh, neutralizing antibody has any role? with reference to the breakthrough infection? And how actually we can uh, increase the level of neutralizing antibodies? Uh, see, neutralizing antibodies have a role, but this the vaccine that has been used is yes, the sir. Wuhan vaccine, was the original sequence. Now you're dealing okay. with Delta, vex, uh, Delta variant. Delta variant has at least 17 mutations. So the yes, virus... Yes the RBD is mutated, it's a change. That is why I've been saying that if you want to give a booster, then don't give a Wuhan booster, give a Delta booster, mm -hmm. then you'll have protective antibodies, which will neutralize the, the variant which is circulating. Lambda is going to come and Lambda is going to be devastating. So I think we are wasting quite a lot of time saying that mm -hmm. Delta plus is going to cause this, Delta... Delta is smoldering, but when a new, whenever outbreaks have occurred in persons who are already having some antibodies, it is because the virus has had immune escape. And that will exactly. be because there's variation in the RBD. So the, the, uh, the breakthrough, vax, uh, breakthrough infections you're suffering, that you're getting yes, will be through a new virus. So yes. we have to do the surveillance, the genetic surveillance. Again, I think we have wasted a lot of resources, but not following the right advice. Mm -hmm. For doing the doing the, the sequencing, you do not have to sequence the whole gene. Exactly. You have to sequence only the spike protein. Yes, sir. And look at mutations in the spike protein. Yes. See, 
there are variants of no interest yes. variants of interest variants of consequence and variants of high consequence we have wasted a lot of resources in sequencing the whole yes. virus the 30000 uh, uh, base pairs rather than the 1230 uh, 1273 that we need to focus on the spike protein spike and protein. there are pcrs available and as you know pcr now is costing okay. four and a half thousand not the uh, the the amount you required for next generation sequencing so by doing pcr of the isolate we had one student one of our colleague who had infection in 2020 then two vaccination doses and okay. then he had very high titus but when he got infected again, we knew that it's a Delta variant. We, we had RT-PCR positive. So we sent it. But we sent it and we got no results, okay. no response. So but this is not how scientific decisions can be taken. But this is what is happening in India. That we know that we are dealing with Delta variant. And if you are having a lot of um, a, lo a lot of breakthrough infections, then okay. these will be variants. And the variant, okay. one of the variant which has immune escape along with okay. high transmissibility is the one which will cause the third, okay. third wave. Sir, uh, one more question, sir, very small. Uh, sure. Mixing the vaccine, they tell us it is a better. Yes, it, uh, the same there way. is evidence. Oh. See, there is evidence. Uh, first, yes. actually, it happened in Europe. In Europe, we had started with uh, with Oxford virus, uh, Oxford uh, uh, vaccine. Then they found that a few persons, one in a million or so, had suffered from uh, from thrombosis. As a yes. consequence, the regulators put a stop to uh, Oxford vaccine being used in Europe. So since the patients were uh, the volunteers were already there. Then they offered them, uh, they offered them Pfizer vaccine, and they found that the immune response after Oxford and Pfizer was better than Pfizer and Pfizer or Oxford and Oxford. Similarly, as you notice in Gorakhpur, uh, ICMR has also reported that they had a mix-up of Covishield and Covaxin, and the report was better. So. A heterologous combination gives you both the flexibility of taking the vaccine. So take whichever vaccine is available. Okay. But take two doses. One dose is not protective okay. against the Delta variant. So please take two doses. Take whatever is available. All vaccines will protect against death and severe infections. They will not protect against uh, against infection. So please keep on using COVID appropriate behavior. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Very informative. Uh, sir, it's a very nice session. Uh, I would like to ask you that if we open up schools and colleges, uh, how safe can we be in this? It will uh, be a disaster. It will, it will be, be a big disaster. They have opened, see, wherever they have opened in, in US, they opened last year. Then they had to close. So uh, I understand the, the issues involved, but till the children are vaccinated, I don't think we should send them to school. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, very nice, sir. Now, uh, more than one and a half hour. I, sir, to, I truly agree with this comment, sir. Without vaccination, no children should be allowed in the school. Now, they are the most vulnerable population. And, uh, uh, you know, to avoid the third wave, this should really be practiced. Totally yes, agree, and sir. it is there that it is it's possible that children will have mild infection. Yes, but it's true, sir. infection... Uh, then they will carry the infection back where the grandparents are there. Absolutely. And his grandparents Absolutely. will be knocked out. So the children may not, may, the may not, mortality in children may not be there. 
but child, uh, the grandparent mortality will be very high. Very so, high. Uh, so it's the totality that you have to look at. But in and India, sir, six states already have started schools. Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. what I was trying to say, sir, whether Even the in government my state. will understand this, the policymakers have to understand this. Yeah. Otherwise, um, with a 50% capacity, they have started. 50% capacity. And they are giving one reason that these children are moving in the market. They are going on the play playground. They are meeting each other everywhere. Then oh, why not in the school? <laughs> Sir, in the school, just imagine the whole school bus is full of the school children. Then in the school, it is there. The whole now also, sir, many parents are reluctant. They should understand. Many parents, I mean, those who are intelligent enough to understand the uh, the graveness of the situation, they will not allow their children. I myself definitely would not. Yeah, yeah, but that situation I'm telling. Yeah, yeah. I I agree that uh, see even in the West because both the parents are working. And if the children have nowhere to go, then they cannot go to, uh, then the parents cannot do the work. So as long as it was work from home, there was not a problem. Correct. There was no problem. But once you say that now you start coming to office. But no, the, what you have told is also right, sir. The mortality rate, even our task force also have told. The mortality rate in children is a very, very, very less. Yes. Exactly. Unless and until you don't have comorbidity. So only the children with a comorbidity should not go to the school. Uh, sir, I somehow don't agree. Uh, not just those with comorbidities. You don't have much of comorbidities in children. Yeah, but yeah, there is very less comorbidity, but there is a comorbidity. Yes. Maybe there yeah. is, sir. But the fact is that how many students meet in the playground uh, elsewhere? Hardly a few of them. But in school, the whole lot of school children will be there. The that whole is not, lot that, that is not, I'm, I'm not talking that. I'm talking about the mortality in children. So, um, I don't think mortality in children would be a concern. Correct. Mortality in elderly in the family. That means every family. Yes, yes. yes. Every, uh, the children will bring infection back. They may act as a carrier into Absolutely. into every every family. <laughs> and uh, at the moment, uh, the elderly have remained confined. Okay, okay. sir. Okay, Lavu. I hope that we'll stop now, and uh, there is a enough brainstorming discussion. We we'll look and, forward to more of it. Yes, I will go to Jay. Jay, sure. Jay, please. Sure. Over to Jay. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. It was very much pleasure to have you with us and we hope that we will meet very soon on the same platform. It was very informative. Thank you for your time, sir. Yes, and this talk would to... be beneficial for the policy makers. They should be attending such talks. Then only they'll make the right policies. Pardon, Are pardon, ma'am. This type of talk, uh, I mean, the policy makers or the people higher up should have attended this talk to because they are passing the circulars that uh, children have to come to school and college uh, students have to come in, uh, I mean, all the classes that too in physical mode. But Nothing madam, I'm having, I'm having another opinion. Leave about the children. But for the college students, I'm totally agreeing that college should start. 50% capacity. That is my opinion. Okay, we'll justify it later on. Yes. I, I think they should be vaccinated. The yeah, vaccinated is possible. Vaccine is there. Once you are vaccinated, then right. then you can you give permission that is vaccinated student can come in the college yes. after 15 days. Agreed. Yeah. Vaccinated. Okay, many so, of them are not 18, so that is why. No, no, above 18, is, uh, above 18, yes. we can allow at least. Uh, but Why first year student, year students you are, are not, 16. You are not allowing even PhD student. Universities are closed, not to work at all. Uh, uh, that is wrong. Sir. I think after vaccination, all staff should be allowed to. Yes, yes, back. yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks to all attendees also. Many attendees are there and uh, they have uh, graced the today's talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.